All right, I want to take a text this morning in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 7, and I want to preach on this thought, what in the world is going on? What in the world is going on? In Revelation 22, verse 7, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. Uh, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Uh, the Lord said at the end of the book of Revelation that he comes quickly. He is coming again. And I want to preach a little bit about the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, did you know that the Bible reads ahead of tomorrow's newspaper? In fact, one of the things that sets the Bible apart from the other and, and every other book is that it is a book of prophecy. The Bible says in Revelation 19, verse 10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What I preach to you today has been proclaimed by faithful preachers and shared by faithful Christians for centuries. Prophecy, someone once said, is history written in advance. Allow me to give a broad overview before bringing our present situation into focus. J. Barton Payne itemized 127 Messianic predictions involving more than 3,000 verses in the Bible. One of those is a familiar one. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now this passage illustrates the literal promise. Now I, I use that verse because it is familiar to many of us. Unto us a child is born. We hear that verse over and over again around the Christmas season. Why? Because this verse written by Isaiah hundreds of years before Christ was born prophesied that he would be born along with many other passages in the Bible. This passage is no different. Uh, but this verse goes on to say, not only is unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, which is a reference to uh, Christ uh, dying on the cross for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so a son was given. But then it goes on to say, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor. And it talks about his government and his kingdom. So just as literally, it, this verse prophesied that Jesus would be born, just as literally, this passage prophesied that Jesus would die on the cross, this passage literally says that Jesus will be, a, be the king over this entire earth. Uh, and beyond. Amen. He'll be the king of everything. Uh, so that, that's an important uh, understanding. See, during Jesus' earthly ministry, he confirmed that he would indeed reign as the king. He was called the son of David. The Jews expected this to happen in their lifetime. The fact that he wasn't going about it the way they wanted and expected is one of the reasons that they rejected him. Now, even after the resurrection, moments before Jesus ascended into heaven, his apostles asked this question in Acts chapter 1, verse number 6. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Is it time now? <laughs> Our Lord answers this question with, with, in, in, a very, in a way that is very pertinent to us today. And that he says this, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his power. That, that's important. God says, you know what? That's not really your business to know exactly when I'm coming again and when I'm going to restore the kingdom. Then he goes on to say there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. And so uh, that's what he said. Just be busy about the Father's work. So regardless of what's going on today, that's the, the title, right? What in the world's going on? Well, 
Uh, regardless of what's going on today or what's coming in the future, we need to be about our Father's business. Uh, that is for sure. That's what the Lord tells us to do. Now, one of the good things about the whole thought of what in the world's going on, uh, there's many in the world that don't know exactly what's going on. And of course, we don't know exactly what tomorrow may hold. But the good news is, praise God, I, I may not know uh, what, what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand as one songwriter said. So what in the world's going on? See, we, we have been living in the time between the two comings of the Lord Jesus Christ that I read there in Isaiah chapter number nine. So he was born, he died on the cross, but then he said, okay, I, I fulfilled that part of it. I came the first time, that's called the first advent, but then there's the second advent, the second coming of Christ. He is coming again. And we've been living in the, the time between the two appearings of the Lord Jesus Christ, known as the church age, because the church made up of Jews and Gentiles alike has been the prominent feature in God's working over this time. Jesus said there would be a certain times, certain signs that would precede his second coming to earth. Matthew 16, verse 3 said, You can discern the face of the sky, but you, can, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Or can you not d d discern the times, signs of the times, Jesus asked the Pharisees. Now, over the last 100 years, these signs have been appearing at an accelerated rate. Now, I want you to listen closely to me. The signs that he talks about for his second coming speaks of his second coming to return and to rule on this earth to physically, just as he was physically born and physically died, he's going to physically uh, come back and reign on uh, this earth. And the signs will precede that coming. Now, as, as we'll see here in just a minute, uh, there is a, 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 another appearing that kind of comes in there to where the Lord doesn't come all the way to the earth, where he comes into the clouds. Jesus himself spoke of this appearing, and the Apostle Paul tells us about that as well. Paul goes into great detail, in fact, in the epistles, especially concerning the days leading up to the seven years of tribulation that will precede his coming to earth. Those seven years, uh, this seven years was prophesied by Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter number nine. Uh, and uh, these seven years will precede Jesus sitting on his earthly throne. One of the promises given is that before the seven years begin, the Lord will appear in the clouds to call Christians home. This is not to say that, that Christians may not experience tribulation or trials. Look around the world. Christians have been, are experiencing tribulations and trials, and they have for the last 2,000 years. However, the period known as the Great Tribulation or the se Daniel 70th week, uh, listen, the church, Christians will not be, be uh, here for one moment of those seven years. Uh, th this is referred to as the rapture of the church. The rapture is illustrated, interestingly enough, in the Old Testament with Enoch in Genesis chapter number five. Enoch was translated. He was called to be with the Lord before the flood came, amen? And God safely carried Noah and his family through that time of judgment, just like God will safely carry the nation Israel through the seven your tribulation period. But Enoch went out before the rain fell. Amen. And we're going out before this seven year period starts. It's all also pictured in Lot. And this is a sad illustration uh, because this will be the condition, no doubt, of many uh, Christians. Lot was there in uh, the, the city of Sodom. And God said, I'm going to rain down the city, but before I can bring down judgment on the sins of Sodom, I must first save Lot out of that city. And then I will rain down judgment. Okay. Now, I, I talked about the signs of the times. Most of those refer to the fact that Jesus is coming again to set up his kingdom on the earth. Um, but now there was one vital prophetic component that had to come to pass before the rapture. And that, that is this, Israel must be a nation. 
an idea that for nearly 1900 years seemed impossible. That is, until 1948, when the nation of Israel, to, to, well, there wasn't a nation of Israel, to where when the Jews went from being slaughtered by the millions to almost overnight becoming a nation in the land that God had promised them so long ago. God, uh, in the book of Ezekiel, God likened the nation of Israel as a defeated and a slaughtered army that was left on the, uh, on the battlefield until the corpses decayed and the remaining bones were sun-bleached and scattered across the valley. A valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37. However, in time, God spoke. And when God spoke, those scattered bones from across that valley began to shake and began to rattle. And then, and, and then those bones began to shake and rattle. Then all of a sudden those bones began to come back together, belonging to each body that they had gone to before. And all of a sudden, uh, here's these skeletons. What a vision this would have been. Uh, what stood all over the valley. And as they stood there, all of a sudden, uh, their, their, their ligaments and tendons and muscles and finally the flesh uh, came on them. And there they stood as a mighty army. And then God breathed upon them and brought them to life. Uh, see, I, I use that illustration because that scattering of Israel uh, is, is how they were scattered all across the globe. But God is bringing them back again. And this will be completely fulfilled in the seven years of tribulation, which is really the time of Jacob's trouble, which is the time of Israel's trouble. Um, but uh, I digress to say this. There's indeed been a lot of moving and shaking going on over the recent generations. For years, the Jews were like these scattered bones across the world. But there's been some shaking, <laughs> amen. There's been some moving. And I'm telling you, it's a pretty awesome thing. Since we had our last service here at the church, uh, we, uh, we've done some remodeling and we built a uh, fairly large uh, platform. And I can't wait to see y'all and I can't wait to, uh, to, to, for, for y'all to see what we've done. And there's, there's still work in progress, but uh, man, it's going to look different. But there's this huge platform that we built. And uh, we've got a good group of guys that showed up and, and, and got to work on the prep work, you know, tearing out and measuring out and doing all these kinds of things. Uh, and then framing, electrical, sound, uh, all the stuff uh, that's running beneath the stage that has to be there. Again, the electrical there was a lot of planning and a lot of work going on before we were starting to actually put the top back on the stage. Well, I remember one day working in the stage down in the framing, doing whatever uh, I was doing. Uh, nothing that important, I'll be sure to tell you. Uh, but I was working and I was helping. When all of a sudden I began to see guys bringing some of the decking in, some of the, 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 the wood that's going to go down over top of the, uh, of, of the platform. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, are, are you guys ready to put that down yet? But no, they weren't. But what they were showing was, we're getting close. We're getting close. And they, they may have even brought a piece or two up on the stage just to kind of see how it was going to be. The point that I'm making is this. Their attention began to be, began to be uh, uh, taken away from the, some of the tasks that were going on underneath the surface because it was almost all done. and But not totally done, but it was getting close. And so they began to say, okay, now let's start getting some of this plywood in here. Let's start getting some of this laid out. How are we going to go about doing this? The point that I'm trying to make is this. They were kind of going to a phase two. Uh, all right. So within the last hundred years, it's become clear that the Lord is approaching kind of a phase two, if you will. His attention has shifted more to the nation of Israel. The church age will be wrapping up soon. Amen. I mean, that, that's kind of what we see here. For years, they were a scattered people that, that, of course, God cared for. But all of a sudden, he says, okay, it's time. You're becoming a nation. Even, even within this administration, Current presidential administration, uh, President Trump officially recognized, re recognizing Jerusalem as the nation's capital is another huge step. There must be any other, uh, there, there, there are many others that will uh, not take the time to explain today because as you can tell, I'm trying to talk fast. I hope you're listening fast, but I've got a lot to, that I want to try to cover as I, I give this basic overview. 
But I like what the Bible says in Luke chapter 21, verse 28. And he says this about the fig tree, about Jerusalem. And he says, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. Uh, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Now, the, the message of the coming of the Lord, I started this verse off by reading a passage out of Revelation 22 when the Lord Jesus said, I come quickly. Because the message, even if nothing that has gone on since, uh, since the clock turned into January 1st, 2020, even if none of that goes on, I could still stand up here today and preach the message to you, Jesus is coming again. I want to be very clear about that. I have been preaching that message. I, I've been preaching it since the Lord called me to preach in 1995. Why? Because the Bible says Jesus is coming again soon. Amen. It's an, it's an imminent return. So I want to be very clear. There's nothing that's happened that said, oh man, wow, now Jesus must be coming. No, Jesus is coming, amen, regardless. But there are some interesting things uh, that have, uh, have developed or are, uh, you know, are, are pretty clear at this point. And I just want to share some of those things. And, and I, I want to be uh, really candid with you at this point just for a moment. Uh, there, there's a principle that I live by as a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a representative of the truth that will set you free. With the knowledge that I will give an account for every word that I speak to you today and any time, uh, I, I take it very seriously. For instance, I seldom recommend a preacher or a teacher or a ministry from the pulpit especially unless I can endorse virtually the whole of his teaching and of his life. I just don't do that uh, because I don't want to be responsible for leading someone toward that way. And it's the same way as I approach a message like this, because I gave you a basic overview, but now I, wanna, I do want to bring into focus some things, some specifics, I guess, that relate to today. However, uh, I want to stay away from conspiracy theories, all right? Conspiracy theories, and there's a lot out there. And some of them uh, could be true, all right? I mean, a good conspiracy theory wouldn't be too good if it couldn't be true if there was no truth to it. And, but I tell you, I just, I just warn you about uh, if, if you're going to uh, get into following a conspiracy theory, if you're, if you're going to read an article, if you're going to watch a video, do that. That's fine. It really is. But, but don't just read it and take it as the gospel because it's not the gospel, uh, all right? Take it, number one, find out who made it. Find out what their agenda is. Find out other uh, documentaries or movies they've made or, or, or articles that they've written. Find out about this person. Find out about the people that are quoted. I mean, find out everything you can about the people that give quotes, about the people that give interviews in these things. And after you do all of that, then you can come and, de and decide a little bit better about what it is that you are following or what it, what it is that you would like to uh, propagate. I say that to say this because a lot of times until it can be proved as evidence, it's just inference. It's just inference. It's, it's, it's not necessarily facts. And even just people taking clips here and there, that's not enough for me to uh, follow that. So I'm saying all that to say this. I am not uh, looking to propagate a, a conspiracy theory. Now, if you'd like to sit down and have a speculative conversation outside of the pulpit, I could tell you I could probably enjoy that, amen? Uh, but, but when it comes to standing in this pulpit and preaching the truth to you today, I don't want to get into some things. I don't want to base my, I'm not going to put my credibility on the line by trusting some people that I, that I really don't know and haven't really looked into because that means a lot to me. So, uh, so I just want to let you know kind of where I'm coming from. I will say this, there's not much that I would put past communist China and the lunacy of the socialist movement. I will not be satisfied, however, with inference, inference but, uh, but I will be satisfied with evidence that's beyond a reasonable doubt because those are two different things. Now, um, as we approach this, I want to Talk not, not so much about those that would say that the, the globalist and the socialist caused this thing. To me, that is a theory, conspiracy theory. 
But I can tell you something that is not a theory, and that is this. The socialists and the globalists are taking full advantage of the, the, the circumstances surrounding this virus. And you know what I want to pause and say right there, too? I'm glad Christians are taking advantage as far as trying to get the gospel out, amen? And, and we've got an agenda, and that's to spread hope. It's to spread peace. It's to share the love of Christ, amen, and to see people set free from their sins, to find what it is to be saved by the grace of God. I mean, uh, but, but the, 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 the globalists, the socialists, and, and the like, listen, they are taking full advantage of this, clearly. That's not a conspiracy, that's just a fact. So with this in mind, I'd like to just close with a few prophetic points uh, that I believe relate to what in the world's going on. So one thing in the world that's going on is globalism, the rise of globalism. Now, this did not just take place over the last couple of months, all right? The rise of globalism, the push for a global government. What is globalism? When, when we speak of that, it's a global government a global religion, and a global economy or a global currency. This is nothing new. This has been a push uh, for your entire lifetime. I don't care how old you are if I'm preaching to you. This has been a push your entire lifetime. Uh, and you say, how can you say that? Because from the, time, from the League of Nations after World War I was one of the first attempts or one of the greatest attempts in our country's history to be a part of this global initiative. Uh, to, the, to the UN, uh, the organization of the UN after World War II. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting if you go read some of the quotes from George H.W. Bush, the first uh, President Bush. Uh, Joe Biden is one of these guys. You can look, look at some of his interviews. Uh, but their goal of what they called, their words, not mine, what they called a new world order. <laughs> I mean, you hear that, a new world order, that phrase reeks of conspiracy theory, doesn't it? But it's not a conspiracy theory. <laughs> it's really just a fact. Uh, this is what those guys were pushing for a global movement. Gordon Brown, the, the current United Nations Special Envoy for Global Education, according to a March 26th article in LifeSite News, Brown has called for the creation of a global government to cope with the coronavirus pandemic. There, there has to be a coordinated global response. We need some sort of working executive. So, so we need to have a, it's a global problem. Yes, it is. We need a global response. Well, that makes sense, right? Uh, and that's just what, simply what he said. But it is interesting also, he said, we need a working executive. We need somebody to oversee this thing, which will be in just a later point. But uh, the, the measures being pushed uh, are in direct opposi opposition to our Constitution uh, and our Bill of Rights, as we'll see in just a minute. At the 2009 London Summit uh, for the G20, Brown stated, I think the new world order is emerging, and with it, the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. <clears throat> now, you may be sitting there and saying, so what? It is a global problem. It does need a global solution. What's so bad about globalism? Well, for one, the God of the Bible is left out of this globalism. There, it, it's man's effort. It goes back to the Garden of Eden when, when Satan's temptation to man was, you shall be as God. So if you're going to be a God, you don't need anybody else to be your God. So, but number two, it's a socialist push which takes away our God-given unalienable rights Man, listen, rights that have been given to us by God, there's no man that has the authority to take away rights that have been given by God Almighty. A guest on MSNBC earlier this month uh, made this statement. He said that Americans are freedom-obsessed. 
They're uh, freedom obsessed. And it was just in response to Americans not wanting to do every, every last thing they were told, uh, when the government said to do it, how the government said to do it, etc. Uh, and so he said, Americans are freedom obsessed. And may I just pause as an American and say this, I plead guilty to that. Amen. I believe in freedom. I believe in liberty. See, there, the, the, there's, there's globalists that are involved in trying to solve the pandemic problem while also attempting to solve the liberty problem. The liberty problem. And it is, uh, liberty is a problem for globalists. Americans, thank God Americans, still have that patriot defiance that proclaims uh, that, you know, the, the flag that has become famous over the last 20 years, uh, but, but, but goes all the way back to our country's founding, don't tread on me, right? Don't tread on me. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm not trying to bother anybody, but don't come messing with me as an American, right? And so that's that patriotic spirit. But, but, but that reminds me of something else that is important. Uh, do you know what America's very first uh, commissioned flag was? Not don't tread on me, but it was commissioned by President George Washington. And I wish you'd look this up. And the flag was this. And on the, it, was, it had a tree on it, but on the bottom of it, it said this, an appeal to heaven, an appeal to heaven, a cry to heaven, a call to heaven. Amen. And that also is that patriotic spirit that we need to have today. And so uh, while, while peace and global unity are laudable pursuits on the surface, again, it sounds good. What's the problem? Such goals ought to be seen in the light of what took place at the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis chapter number 11. This event stands as a stark warning against utopianism, against man's proud and unending use of politics, economics, and false religion to attain global unity apart from God. Mankind's ability to fashion such a world was forfeited at the fall, and until we return to our Creator and embrace His appointed means to reach this goal, mankind's, mankind's quest for global unity will inevitably end in chaos and utter destruction. See, the problem with this global globalism is who, who are the people in charge? I suppose if they were all... Perfectly righteous people, that would be okay. But the problem is it's going to be men in charge, men with ulterior motives, men that have other things in mind. And uh, that's why it will never work apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. See, according to the scripture, mankind will indeed finally succeed in creating this global counterfeit kingdom. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, Revelation 16, verse 9, Revelation 17, verse eight, but God is going to bring it down, son. Just like he did Babel, he's going to bring down their, uh, their global task. And he's going to bring in, hallelujah, Revelation chapter 21, he's going to bring in an everlasting true kingdom that's going to be ruled with righteousness and justice and the grace of Almighty God, amen. And Jesus will be the king during that time. Hallelujah for that. But so, uh, so, so another thing about this that we see involving the, globalist, the, the globalistic move, again, there's, there's no conspiracy theory tied into this. This is just what is happening. Uh, this counterfeit kingdom uh, is, is just that. It's a counterfeit kingdom. You say, what do you mean by that? Satan has been attempting to counterfeit, and he does. Satan attempts to counterfeit all that God does. Satan has no originality. He tries to counterfeit that which God does. And you could preach a whole message on that. Just sit and think about the things that God has created that Satan has tried to pervert and counterfeit. All right, and, and, and the kingdom is, 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 is that way, right? Jesus, the Bible says, is the savior of the world. And, the, and this savior of the world is going to return and he's going to set up a righteous kingdom over this earth. So guess what Satan has planned all the way back? He started this in Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel. He said, okay, I'm going to have my savior. That savior in the Bible is referred to as the Antichrist. See, 
with all the, 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 the chaos that's going to take place in the world, um, listen, there's going to be need, need somebody that has the answers. And the Antichrist is going to be the answer man. He's going to have the answers when he comes. So he's the Antichrist. It's the world savior, as it were. But not only that, he's also going to try to have a kingdom. So Jesus is having a kingdom. So all this is, is it's a counterfeit of what the Lord is going to do in time. Not only that, much of what we have seen happen has followed the script, just talking about the, the move of globalists, of an event that was held on October 2019 in New York City, uh, a meeting that was called Event 201, a global pandemic exercise. And I, again, I'll remind you, this was held in October 2019, and it's amazing uh, the, the things you can actually go back and watch, their, the videos and the clips from it, uh, but it just talks about their, their global... Uh, what would be their, their response if there were a pandemic? And so much of what is happening, they're following this script. I'm not blaming them for it. Don't, you didn't hear me say that. All I'm just simply saying is there was globalists involved in having a plan because uh, obviously there's been pandemics uh, in the world on many occasions throughout the, the centuries. Now, uh, on the religious front, just bear with me. So it's a one world government, one world religion. On the religious front, Pope Francis is a globalist, an unapologetic globalist. And add to that the watered-down, please-everyone uh, gospel, quote-unquote gospel, that's being preached, that's leading so many so-called evangelists or, or evangelicals. Listen, that plays very nicely. This, this, this uh, non-offensive, non please everybody, uh, preaching and, uh, and, and so forth, nothing sin, nothing's wrong. Stuff, it plays very nicely. Uh, you know, the ones they preach is, you know, the, this, this easy believism that, uh, that, that, that everybody's going to heaven. They're, they're, they preach this universal gospel. That's going to play very nicely, I believe, in the world, one world religion because that's basically what they're espousing. Uh, there's even some evangelicals, which is just still blows my mind, so-called evangelicals that, uh, that, that say that the God of Islam is our blessed heavenly father. They say that's the same God. Folks, that is wrong. But on the religious front, we can already see what the Bible warned was a great falling away. Amen. And so uh, we need to stand and stay with the truth. Uh, going cashless. I talked about a one world economy, uh, a one world economy. On March the 2nd, the World Health Organization issued a call for people to refrain from using banknotes due to the possibility of COVID-19, clinging to the service of money uh, and credit cards, which were made of plastic because they could hold the virus even longer. I mean, again, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, get rid of the money. And, and, and may I just pause right there and say this? Most, most people don't hardly use cash anymore anyway, do we? We just use credit cards. We use bank payments. And I want to hasten to say this. I'll say it again in just a moment. But there is nothing sinful about using uh, a card or an automatic payment or anything. All, or, all I'm saying is, is that it's a precursor for something. There are globalists right now who are racing to develop a digital ID that every human on the planet will need to do just about anything. Uh, so, and, and, and again, that's Revelation 13, Revelation 16, Revelation 14. Uh, then, and of course, that is, in, in Revelation 13, that's the mark of the beast. But now, this whole, you know, implants or, or whatever digital thing that can be put on us, I want to say something very clearly here, that it is impossible. It is impossible to receive the mark of the beast while the church is still on this earth. I'll say that again. It is impossible to receive the mark of the beast while uh, the church is still on this earth. For those of you that have, you know, it's, it's a very common thing today. People having their animals, uh, you know, impl uh, you have a, a microchip put into them and all that. They're not receiving the mark of the beast. It's just a smart, convenient thing, all right, in, in that instance. See, the reason it is impossible for someone to receive the mark of the beast uh, while the church is here is that the beast is a reference to the Antichrist, and he's the man chosen to lead the global government. While this man may be, uh, he, he may very well be on earth today, the Antichrist. Um, he may even be holding some political office. 
He will, but he will not be revealed until after the rapture of the church. Thus, the mark of the beast will not be introduced until after the rapture. And so be, listen to what I'm saying very clearly. I am not here today telling you that the pursuits of a some kind of implant to go or even something on the surface of our right hands or so forth, I am not telling you that that's a fulfillment of Revelation 13 and the mark of the beast because it is not. All right. And furthermore, the push of the globalists that, have, again, have been very, very active for a long time. Uh, I'm not telling you that this is the administration of globalists that will be able to set up the Antichrist. I'm not telling you any of that. But I, I think about this. In, in uh, Matthew 24, in his Olivet D Discourse, Jesus likened the end times when he says at uh, the time of sorrows, that, that, that word sorrows speaks of a woman that is in labor. A woman that is in labor. Now, the first time a woman who is going to give birth feels a pain does not mean she's given birth, does it? It does not mean she's given birth, but it's a sign that it's coming. And there's, uh, she has a pain, and she has another pain, and then she has a, another pain. And, and I'm not telling you blessed ladies anything, amen. Uh, you know all the pain that's involved there. But then finally, uh, it leads up to a beautiful baby being born. Thank you, moms. But that's what Jesus said this prophetic stuff is like. He says there's movements and there's pains. And that's what I believe this is today. Could the Lord come again before I finish my next sentence? Absolutely, amen. And as I told you before, I was preaching that when I first started preaching in 1995 because it was true then as well. If I'm still preaching on this earth 25 years from now, it'll be true then, okay? It's an imminent return. And you say, well, I thought you said these things are a lot, uh, are, you know, the, the precursors to the coming of the Lord. All I'm telling you is they're kind of the birth pains. They are, uh, they're simulations, amen. They're dress rehearsals. There's been things for years like this taking place that are preparing for the coming of the Lord. <laughs> but I believe, folks, that the Lord's coming again soon. Amen. Uh, and, I, and I always have. Amen. He said, behold, I come quickly. The Apostle Paul as well. But, 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 the, but the signs that we have, have are amazing. Now, it gets down to this. What can we do? What are we going to do about all this? The question is not what can we do, but what will you do? All right. Number one, I got to say this. People say, oh man, I'm looking at all this stuff, watching all this stuff. It's scaring me to death. If you're a Christian, amen, don't be scared. The Bible says God's not giving you the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind, amen. And you know what we can do? We can rejoice, amen. We can praise the Lord. Why? Because we've got an idea what in the world's going on for one thing, right? I mean, we understand that these things must come to pass. I believe that there's enough uh, patriotic uh, fervor uh, that's going to, that, that'll push back against these measures and that, that it'll recede once again. But I don't know what's going to happen. But all I know is this, regardless, man, we can rejoice. Amen. Why? Because the Lord will not, it is not and will not be taken by surprise. We do not have to be scared. Amen. If you are experiencing fear as a Christian, you're in the wrong sources. Amen. Get, get away from those that are uh, allu the illusions and the fear. Man, get into the book. Amen. Get into the good news of the gospel. Don't worry, but rejoice and be happy. And lastly, I'll say this. I'll tell you, I'm just going to reiterate what Jesus told his disciples right before he ascended up into heaven there in Acts chapter number one. I started with this. I'm going to end with it. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? We could look to the Lord and say, Lord, are you coming now? You know what I believe the Lord would look at us and say? That's not for you to know because it's not. So don't spend too much time worrying about it, amen, or trying to figure it out if he said it's not for you to know. That's not for you to know, he says. He says, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's happened to us now, amen. We're saved if you're saved by God's grace. I mean, listen, uh, you have the Holy Spirit of God and you shall be witnesses. What are you going to do? Don't fear, work. Amen. Work. Win souls. Let me tell you something. Quit trying to win arguments and try to win hearts. Amen. 
win souls, amen, share the love of Christ, share the good news, amen, be enthusiastic about the goodness of God and the promises of God and the sure foundation on which we stand and our faith stands, the evidence that our faith stands upon today. Don't try to win arguments. Try to win hearts with the glorious truth of the gospel. Now, you may be listening to me today, and maybe you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I understand you having fear, but I want to tell you something. You don't have to live that way. You know why? Because you can accept the Lord Jesus Christ right now. You say, preacher, are you trying to scare me that the Lord's coming again and the Antichrist is appearing and all this stuff? No, not at all. Those things are real. But what I want to appeal to you today is this. The Bible says you have sinned. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That sin invites the judgment of God. The Bible says this, uh, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.18 we're condemned because of our sin. We were all born sinners for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But the good news, the good news is this. Jesus loved you and Jesus loved me enough that he came to this earth. He carried our sins upon him. He took the punishment and the payment for our sins. He took our hell on Calvary. He was separated from God the Father for you. He paid for your sins. He cried out on the cross, it is finished. He rose again the third day, and the Bible says this, for the wages of sin is death. There is death, there is condemnation because of our sin. But Jesus already took it. But if you re reject him, you're going to have to take it. But he goes on to say this, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. Receive the gift. How do you receive this gift? The Bible says it very simply this way. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Are you willing today to turn from your sins? Are you willing to, today to say, Lord, I changed my mind. I don't want to go this way anymore. I want to go your way. I want to turn from my sins. I want to turn to you. I want you to come into my heart and into my life and be my Savior. Listen, if, you, if you'll call on him today, he will save you. Amen. And you could pray like this. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I turn today from my sins and I turn to you. Please be my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Listen, you can, if, you, if you prayed that prayer from your heart today, you can thank him for saving you. And you don't have to live in fear. Amen. And you can share and tell somebody else the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. And until next time and until he comes, uh, we'll see you then.